Greetings again in Jesus' name. Continuing with this series about exploding these myths of this Reformed doctrine that is in the system today, I want to go over some more of the absurdities that we hear all the time from people that keep posting on the websites, on the YouTube channels, on the blogs, always constantly following the same thin, thing, that anybody that claims to have, have been cleansed and purified by faith through a real and genuine repentance and faith proven by deeds is, is a liar and the truth's not in them, they're a hypocrite, they're self-righteous, and all the rest of it that you've heard me say. As though anyone that says that they've, they've stopped fornicating, they've stopped committing adultery, they've stopped doing these vile things that even common decency s s speaks against, but yet these people in the system keep saying about you sin daily, you're the Romans wretch, and all the rest of it. See, what you got to do is you got to ditch this idea of that you're earning your salvation by stopping sin. No, by stopping sin, you're getting redeemed from the corrupting influence of sin. That's, remember redemption? Redemption means to be released from bondage by payment of ransom. That's what real redemption is. It's not a provision. It's not a substitution. It's a true release from bondage. It's real it's a real born-again experience. It's a genuine transformation that takes place. So you've got to get rid of this idea that you're earning your salvation or that you're sinless perfection. See, we get this all the time on the YouTube channel. Oh, you're, you're sinless. You're teaching. We don't teach sinless perfection. We teach purity of heart. It's not, it's not sinless perfection to abstain from the sins listed in the Bible that will disqualify you from the kingdom. Those scriptures in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, in Ephesians 5, uh, 5 through 7, in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it says, let no one deceive you. Be, if you do these things, you won't inherit the kingdom. If you're a drunkard, if you're a fornicator, if you're an adulterer, if you're homosexual, it's not just being mean to say that. It's a warning put in the scriptures to show you that those type of things will not inherit the kingdom. So it's not sinless perfection to abstain from those things. See, it's nonsense. See, you can't be... See, what we're teaching here is that you cannot be a Christian or remain a Christian by committing those sins in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, and like I, I just said. You, can't, you cannot remain a Christian or even be, ever become one. If you've never, if those things have never, never stopped, if you've never been redeemed, released from that bondage, that addiction, if you're still viewing pornography, if you're still addicted to lust, if you still have a filthy mind that can't have any pure thoughts, you've never been redeemed. It's that simple. And people like Ray Comfort and Billy Graham and all these other guys out there, that's, they're teaching that you, re, you remain filthy. See, so... If you can't stop doing these vile things, then why be a Christian or claim that you're one? See, if you've truly repented and put the old man to death, the body of sin being done away with, newness of life has come, the flesh is crucified, then you're no longer addicted to lust and fornication and drunkenness and these broken relationships and going to person to the next person to the next person, having children without being married and all this wrecked lives that we see testified of on the blogs. You need to be redeemed. You need to be truly, truly transformed. Like that metamorphosis, that's what that word is, metamorphosis takes place. There is true redemption in Christ. But you're not going to find it within the system of people like Comfort and all these other guys out there that go out in the streets and try to teach this pinpoint evangelism that they call it, trying to convince people they're sinners and they pray the sinner's prayer, they receive Jesus. That's not, that's not the plan of redemption. That's why I'm against these things. Let God be the judge of these men. I'm not being the judge. I'm just exposing that what they're teaching is not the plan of redemption in the Scriptures. The plan of redemption in the Scriptures is ransom, reconciliation, and redemption through repentance and faith proven by deeds, not a provision and a magic cover for sins. That's not what it is. So, 
you got to repent of these things. So most people, under that, that system, they repent of what? They repent of their unbelief. Well, unbelief, well, most people have always believed to begin with. See, you got these people that profess to be Christians, deliberately committing sins of disqualifications, claiming that they're saved, and they've never, never been purified by the blood of Christ. They've never approached that mercy seat, pled for the mercy of God through a repentance and faith, through a repentance that has a clearing of wrongdoing and a vehement desire change. See, you're taught that God's going to change your desires that God's going to clean you up later, that there's going to be this gradual sinning less and less. You mean committing adultery less, getting drunk less, viewing pornography less? Is that, I, I just can't help but think that's what you people mean when you keep defending these things. Or, or do you, am I wrong? Or do you mean that just little slip-ups and uh, a, little, a little, you forgot about this, little sin, sins, not sins of presumption, but, but uh, just mistakes? I can't help but think the people that on these blogs, because of what they talk about, they're addicted to these things, and they claim that they're in Christ. See, they're told that, well, nobody's as perfect as God, so uh, the only way you can uh, come into this is through the provision, because it's God-like perfection. We're not talking about God-like perfection. We're talking about purity of heart. See, why would God create a plan of redemption which are released from bondage by a payment of a ransom, the exceeding great and precious promises that through these we can escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. In Second Peter chapter 1, why would he create this plan and then leave a person in bondage to their addictions to gradually bring them out? The problem is nobody ever comes out. They just keep getting worse. Well, see, the thing is, this absurdity of nobody's perfect even though the Bible says in Matthew 5, 48, be ye perfect. Perfect meaning maturity, lacking nothing of completeness, uh, human integrity and virtue. See, it's moral perfection that's, that's lacking here. It's moral perfection and obedience to God. It doesn't mean God-like perfection. No one can achieve God-like perfection, but people can surely stop committing vile sins of the flesh that will disqualify them from the kingdom. That's my premise. See, I, th I say the Bible's teaching that you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom. Isn't that what the scripture says? Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God becomes, comes upon the sons of disobedience. Be not partakers with them. I, I don't know how much more clear it could be. How much more clear? So it's not God-like perfection. It means a heart that's perfectly devoted to God walking in obedience, in full obedience to his commands. See, the, no one's perfect is not found in the Bible. See, what you guys got under the provision, under the provision you've got, the first, I, I even remember way back when I didn't know any of this stuff, we, when my wife and I first came through a real repentance and been searching the scriptures for months and months, and we were, first thing we were encountered in the church was you were the Romans wretch, the Romans seven wretch, Everybody has this horrible nature inside them. The chief of sinners, I remember the pastor telling me, oh, we're all the chief of sinners. Your desperately wicked heart, filthy rags, you sin daily in thought, word, and deed. Nobody can stop sinning. And that's, that's really pretty much the size of what, of what is pounded into your brains. But yet the Bible teaches the exact opposite. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Does a royal priesthood fornicate? Does a chosen generation view pornography and get married and divorced and married and divorced and run off with another person and another person likes, likes being done in this child molestation that's taking place by ministers of the gospel and then they're accepted back into the ministry? No, no. See, the Bible says you're a royal priesthood, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation, holy nation. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord, right? A special people to serve him acceptably with reverence and godly fear. To walk worthy of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. To live worthy. To be pure in conscience and mind. Paul says, I have always strived to keep my conscience pure before God and man. See, you call him the chief of sinners in your church. You say, Paul's sinning every day. That ain't what the scriptures taught. 
He's talking about his past in that scripture, not what he presently is. That's how the how the Greek how the Greek expression was. And like it says, such were some of you in First Corinthians six eleven six eleven. After it talks about the people who were that will not inherit the kingdom if they do these things. So if you were purchased out of this by the blood of Christ, then you enter into this special relationship to serve Him reverently with godly fear. Like Hebrews chapter 12 talks about, the very last verse. That's the aroma of life. See, you're taught that, that Christ became sin on the cross for you. And that uh, God transferred, he, he had this magic dual imputation, as these, these, these theologians teach, these Bible scholars, pundits. Like I said before, in my last two videos, that stuff came out of the Reformation. It didn't come out of the Bible. It was never taught by the early saints. Nowhere was it ever taught until these, these people decided that salvation was a forensic deal between God and man. No, it wasn't taught anywhere. See, that's why it says in Philippians that, that, uh, that, that indeed I have, have all and abound and I am full and receive all things which were sent to you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. See, he's talking about an acceptable, that the saints offering up an acceptable sacrifice pleasing unto God. The aroma of life. See, this is the aroma of death. The filthy rags, the chief of sinners, the fornicating, the adultery, the filthy mind, the addiction to worldly entertainments, and the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's the aroma of death. Because why? The rotting smell of sin. That's why Jesus could not have become sin on the cross because it says in the Scriptures that He offered Himself up as a sweet-smelling sacrifice unto God. Well, how could sin be a sweet-smelling sack? It'd be, it'd be a stench in the no nostrils of God. It'd be a stench. No, it says that he was blameless, without spot. It says there was no sin in him in 1 John 3. There was, there was no sin in Christ. He could not have been blackened by sin. That's under this penal substitutionary model that's being taught far and wide across the globe today by almost everyone that leaves people in this desperate state of wickedness, in addiction. Why can't these people in the missions ever get victory over their lust, over their drunkenness, and all these? Because they're told that they're going to go to heaven anyway. That God loves them, and he, he forgives them, and He understands that they're just sinful, and they're just this big lump of sin, born that way because of Adam, and all this nonsense, this absurdity. See, the Bible does teach that this moral perfection is a, be able to be achieved by those that walk in the Spirit. Those that walk acceptably before God. That's what the Scriptures teach. Those that depart from iniquity. Those that go and sin no more. Is that being as perfect as God to obey Christ when He said, go and sin no more? See, you, you have to make a determined effort to go through that process of repentance so that you can be truly redeemed from your sins by touching the blood of Christ. This is, this is a real regeneration. See, that's lost today. See, today it's just this forensic acceptance, this nebulous idea that if you pray some words or if you shed a tear and you feel good about it and warm inside when you hear the music and you go to church and you fellowship with everybody else that's nothing but a chief, chief of sinner and, and a Roman's wretch, that you're saved. See, you got all these notions that everything's fine. Well, God blesses the good and the bad, the godly and the ungodly. The rain falls on, on everyone, as it says there in Matthew. It doesn't prove that you're that just because just because the blessings of God may be apparent in your everyday life, or He spared your life on occasion in a dangerous situation, doesn't mean that you have His approval unless you've repented. See, unless you serve Him, unless you obey Him. See, so the, the notion that God requires absolute perfection that no human being can achieve, so Christ had to show up on the scene and live this perfect life without sinning and offer Himself as a provision in man's place is not taught in the Bible. 
So, so then under that system, see, God no longer sees. Just like you, you've seen Comfort and Billy Graham and, and Piper and MacArthur, all these big-name preachers. Well, God no longer sees you. He just sees Christ. He takes the, the pages out of your book and he puts the pages of Jesus' book in your book and there's no longer any vile homosexuality and vile this and, and, and drunkenness and fornication. No, only the God-like perfection of Jesus. That's pure nonsense. That's, that's so absurd. It's like torturing the Scriptures to fit it, try to fit, them in, fit that idea into them. So under that, all you've got to do is believe, and you're then perfect in Christ, even though you remain wretched to the core by your own omission that you post on the blogs every day. This is the basic premise of of Christianity in the world today. And that's what we're contending against. Like I said, we're contending against a system of error. The whole system is in error. Is there any good? Yet there's some good. Certainly, just like in politics. There's some good, there's some bad. Well, same thing in the system. They do some good works, they do. But it's not the gospel, it's not the gospel of redemption bringing people to a regeneration in Christ. Otherwise, we wouldn't see them wallowing in the gutters constantly. We'd see alcoholics redeemed. We'd see drug addicts cleansed. We'd see people addicted to pornography not constantly having to go into a promise keeper's rally over and over again, falling right back into that sin. And like I said, I've heard that testified of many, many times. See, the people that have truly repented are no longer committing these sins of fornication and drunkenness and lust and addicted to worldly entertainments. They're no longer doing those things. Why? Because they're perfect and they're like the per No, because they've been redeemed in Christ. They've been redeemed and purified. So none of that stuff's found anywhere in the Bible. See, it, it, the reason it, it fits so well that people are convinced by this ill logic that you're born in sin, you can never stop sinning, and, and actually consider that the Bible teaches that is because, like one brother said, they have no intention of stopping any of these things anyway. See, if they, would, if they would accept the truth of this, those of you that constantly criticize the message that, that uh, the people that contend for the faith on the blogs and in the YouTube accounts, if, if they were to actually admit this, that God, God requires this, that there's no fornicating Christian, there's no drunken Christian, there's no Christians living in lust and filthiness of the flesh. It's not so, there's no such thing. There's no carnality. The carnally minded is death well, then they'd be terrified out of their minds because the churches would, they would be running for, running for the hills if somebody told them they actually had to work out their salvation in fear and trembling to make their calling election sure in Christ, putting forth a genuine effort to add to their faith. See, it would be an end to the fallacy of the people sitting, in these, sitting under these ministries Instead of then constantly telling them they're nothing more than poor, helpless sinners saved by grace, and they're just beggars out there, then the preachers would actually have to present every man perfect in Christ and bring everyone to a full knowledge of God, to the perfect man and the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ, and be examples to the flock. Contrary to the daydream that most people are living under, professed believers, these professed believers are living under, the Bible actually requires that a person of God, a person that's been redeemed, to present their bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. There's that word again. Transformed. That's the redemption. That's that new birth. Be transformed. Not just to say it, but to experience it. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. So you can prove it. So you can examine your faith and know that it's genuine and not reprobate. A faith that does what God says. A faith that works by love. That purifies your heart. That has victory over the sin, the flesh, and the devil. That puts the flesh to death. That crucifies the flesh with its passions and desires. See, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, this is what happens in regeneration. The mind is renewed from this insanity 
See, that's the problem with most people. That's why people are on these psychotrophics. That's why people are taking a, form, a whole cocktail of drugs today. And then they're mixing alcohol and lust and everything else with it. And then they go kill a bunch of people. And all this nonsense is taking place because of ins the insanity of the mind. They're given over to a reprobate mind. That's the reason. See, the renewing of the mind in Christ by the Spirit when you're truly regenerated by that Spirit. See, the common excuse that everybody sins daily in thought, word, and deed is a deadly fallacy. That's why I come against comfort in the rest of these guys. See, these people that live in constant defeat day after day, they've never truly repented of their sin. If they had, they would, they would find that purity of heart that's at the end of true repentance. They've never strived to enter the narrow gate or dug deep to lay a firm foundation in Christ or counted the cost of discipleship. They've never done any of those things that the Scripture says to do. If they had, their hearts would have been made truly pure by obedience to the truth and the purging of the blood of Christ. When you encounter the blood of Christ, it purges your heart of sin. It purifies your conscience from dead works. What's dead works? This mess in the church, the professed church, the system. It's a mess of dead works. See, they say, the chief of sinners crowd says, it's prideful to claim that you've departed from iniquity, or that he who does what is right is righteous. That you have deeds that were befitting repentance, as it sa says so many times in the scriptures. As though a person that is seeking to self-justify themselves, if they obey Christ and stop sinning and do what's right. Doesn't even common decency testify to your logic, to your sense of common, common sense logic, that that's the way that you would want to obey Christ, stop doing all these vile things that are wrecking your lives and making your lives a, hu a human pile of, of destruction? And calling the people that do these things, oh, they're self-righteous, they don't have no love. Well, the reason we appear you don't have any love because this stuff stings to you folks that are constantly living in sin and you're looking to you're heap, heaping to yourself teachers to tickle your ears turn, turning you away from the true doctrine according to godliness so you never be partakers of his grace you think you are you think you're, you're the pie in the sky when you die by and by you think that's got, what's going to happen because you feel good when you go to church. You shed a few tears sometimes at the altar when you pray. And you feel the Holy Spirit. No, you're feel what you're feeling is a euphoria that comes about conjured up in your own mind. See, the mind works by these neotransmitters in your mind releasing chemicals into your brain to make you feel good. That's why people are addicted to lust and fornication and pornography and all that other stuff. Because the brain releases dopamines into the, into, through neuro, neurotransmitters into the brain that makes you crave for more of that good feeling. Well, see, when the mind's renewed, you have the very opposite of that. Instead of craving for the world, you're craving for the things of God. You're striving to enter. You're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. You're digging deep into the scriptures. You're fulfilled. You're fulfilled by the things of God instead of the things of the world. Love not the world or the things in the world, the, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of God, but of the world. The world's passing away, but he that does the will of God abides forever. You know what it says in 1 John 2? But of course it doesn't mean anything to you. So is it pride, prideful then to depart from iniquity, self-justifying? See, it says... In James 4, he cries out to the people to come close to God. Draw close to God and he will draw close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. How do you purify your hearts? With this provision where you're admittedly still filthy. Just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees that your preachers constantly harp on as the biggest hypocrites that ever walked the face of the earth. What was their problem? What did Jesus say? You cleanse the outside of the cup, but the inside is filthy. You strain at the gnat and swallow the camel. You try to, all the jots and the tittles of all these little things about the letter of the law, but you never fulfill the spirit of the law. You try to establish your own righteousness in doing all this, this 
one, two, three isms, but you've never cleansed your hearts by a faith that works by love. See, purify your hearts, your sinners, you double-minded. See, the double-minded will not inherit the kingdom. Those who are, are divided in heart and double-minded, love in the world. See, lament, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of God and He will lift you up. Isn't that what it says? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those in hunger and thirst for righteousness. He's talking about people, as you call it the Beatitudes in your Sunday school classes. But what Jesus is talking about, He's introducing the, the Scriptures of coming to Him. You're poor in spirit. You're broken. You're sick and tired of being sick and tired of your life. You're broken, you're humbled, you're coming to Him thirsting for His newness of life, for those living waters. Why do you think it, it, it likens, it, the Scriptures liken it always to living waters, of partaking of His flesh and blood, of being part of Christ? Because that's how the human brain works. See, the reason you think you've got a sin nature is because of this, that addictive nature of your mind, those neural transmitters in your own human brains that clicked off so many times that it's now by nature. It's now second-handed, second-natured for you to go look at your pornography, to go uh, lusting after the things of the world. That's the reason. That's the reason. But see, when the mind is regenerated, that's changed. That's transformed. So we look at this long and jagged road with all these detours that lead to one place, one destination, perdition, because it's not teaching the plan of redemption. I, for the life of me, can't understand why so few people, there's just a handful of us, it seems like, that teach the true plan of redemption in Christ through repentance and faith proven by deeds. See, the fallacy of this human depravity that forms in the mind of believers some kind of an inbred sin that inevitably brings about all their sinful nature, calling it the sinful nature, blaming every addiction known to man for it. See, the, the scholars call it this depravity. That's what in the Westminster Confession, the man is born wholly depraved, incapable, wholly dis disposed to wickedness and cut off from God. See, they'll even demonize infants and toddlers. I don't know how many times I say, well, what about, I hear people on the blogs, well, what about little kids who taught them to be selfish? And the, the, the scriptures teach that children, it says Deuteronomy 139, moreover, your little ones, your children, your little ones, your infants, your toddlers, who you say will be victims, you know, going into the land they're talking about, who have no knowledge of right or wrong or good or evil. See, they're not at, the, at an accountability until they sin willfully against their conscience. See, that's what it's talking about in James chapter 2, or James chapter 1, where he talks about sin is conceived in the mind. See, when the, mi when the, will, when the, when the mind and the will combined, then transgression takes place. See, they, they dwell in this depravity angle, that you're born in this state of total degeneracy, wholly indisposed, in evil, just lump of sin, as the old uh, so-called so -called theologians used to call it, and demonizing even infants. See, professed believers don't know, they don't like to think of themselves as totally depraved, but they do key in, the people certainly do key in on this sin nature myth, because it's the perfect excuse for their wrongdoing. And they make that the central core doctrine in their minds to facilitate the substitutionary plan of salvation. And it certainly does. That's the reason they preach the way they do. Because it fits right into it. See, if you have this sin nature that you can't help, that you have no control over, well then, God had to make a provision for you to come in. See, the reason, but there's no support for it anywhere in the Bible. We've went over all the scriptures many, many times. We'll touch on a few of them in the next section here as we close this section and tell you that the main reason that you think that you're born a sinner without ability to obey God and choose between right and wrong is be simply because you don't want to obey God. Because you have to desire. Since if you seek out God, He 
He reveals Himself to those that what? Diligently seek Him. If anyone will come after me, will make a concerted effort to take up their cross and come after Him. So you can choose to obey or disobey, sin or not sin. And we'll cover what he said, what God said to Cain in Genesis 4-7 in the next section.